Good afternoon, guys. I have I've been given two tasks for the next hour. Number one is to keep you guys awake until dinner, and the second one is really the title of my message: the unchanging nature of the gospel across all cultures. The unchanging nature of the gospel across all cultures. Let me begin with two stories. Two stories. A Japanese gentleman by the name of Makoto Yamada, a 70-year-old president of a hot spring hotel in Japan. And uh, the hotel that, that this hot spring was a, uh, a, a well-known century-old hot spring, and uh, it became under investigation for only replacing its water twice a year and failing to put chlorine into uh, the hot spring. It doesn't sound very sanitary, but nobody died or got skin rashes. Um, but this gentleman uh, actually assumed uh, responsibility, apologized for this mistake, quote unquote mistake, in a uh, press conference. And uh, he later resigned as the president of this hotel. But yet the story does not stop there. Mr. Yamada was feeling so ashamed for this incident, for the losing of face or honor that on March 12th of this year, his lifeless body was found with a note. He took his own life because of shame. Now let's fly back to this side of the ocean. We've all heard of too many stories of presidents and CEOs of big companies, maybe pharmaceutical companies, automobile companies, uh, food processing plants, a mechanical design flaw, a E. coli outbreak, an uh, error in some clinical trials that have resulted not just in skin rashes, but in actual death. But what do the CEOs and presidents of these companies do? Sometimes we get an apology, but almost without exception, it becomes a battle, battle between small-time lawyers and big league lawyers. As much as we want to, we don't expect the CEOs of these companies to offer a apology or take on any personal responsibility. It is a matter of litigation, compensation, and uh, lawsuits. Now, my question is, these responses to different uh, to similar wrongdoings and transgressions in different cultures, number one, they remind us that cultures are different. What does not guilty mean to this Japanese gentleman that took his own life? Certainly paying a fine wasn't going to do it. What about CEOs surrounded by their lawyers? Is there any sense of personal responsibility beyond the legal repercussions? Is shame something more than a personal feeling? Is shame a, a outside force that a community bestows on somebody who violates the cultural expectations? Can you run away from shame? Can you run away from guilt? Guys, all these differences matter. And as Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. We need to know that the nations that we're trying to reach, they're not homogenous. Different cultures have different values. They have different worldviews. Even languages in different cultures have different range of meaning. They have different vocabulary bank. The people group that we work with in the South Pacific, they did not have words like grace or forgiveness or love. So a word-for-word -word translation um, is, uh, will often fall short of communicating what we want to communicate. We all know that the gospel needs to be communicated in a way that the intended meaning of the gospel is clear to the audience. Let me say that again. The gospel needs to be communicated in a way that the intended meaning is clear to the audience. We hear the word contextualization a lot, especially in any discussion be, uh, with culture and the gospel. Uh, but what is contextualization? The late Timothy Keller gives this definition on contextualization. He says, to contextualize the gospel means to resonate with, yet defy the culture around you. It means to antagonize a society's idols while showing respect for its people and many of its hopes and aspirations. Keller continues to say, contextualization is not, as it is often argued, 
giving people what they want to hear. It's not about giving people what they want to hear. He says, rather, it's about giving people the Bible's answers. Guys, bad contextualization places acceptance of the message above clarity of the message. Just because a culture has a hard time understanding, accepting the gospel, it does not automatically mean that the presentation isn't clear. The gospel, guys, even when presented with absolute clarity, it will still sound foolish to some people. The gospel will offend. Many people actually will reject the gospel precisely because it was presented with clarity. How to resonate and defy, how to show respect, yet challenge another culture. This is what many missionaries are doing today, right now, trying to learn the language, trying to learn the culture and the worldview. They're laboring hard just so that one day they will have the credibility to stand before an unreached people group and present the gospel with them, to them. How to communicate the good news of the old rugged cross to different cultures is what missionaries talk about. It's what keeps us up at night. It's a piece of the puzzle that we're all trying to solve. The title of the session, again, is The Unchanging Nature of the Gospel Over all cultures. In this session, I have two goals. Number one is to help all of us to understand culture's impact on missions or understand culture's impact on the gospel. But then the second goal is we want at the end of the session for all of us to have confidence in the gospel as we take the good news to the nations. Let's restore our confidence in the gospel as we take the good news to the nations. Now, before we delve into the relationship between gospel and culture, there is one misconception that's hindering cross-cultural workers from completing the Great Commission. Uh, misconception may be a little light, but I'll talk about its dangers later. But the misconception is this. The misconception is that the gospel is somehow a Western message. The misconception is the gospel is Western. I'm going to give you two reasons for this misconception that the gospel is Western. None, the first reason is actually simple. It's, it, it's simply the automatic association from history, from missions history. The peoples of different culture, when they hear the gospel message, they don't just hear the content of the message. They also hear the skin color of the messenger. They also hear the passport country um, of its messenger, and they also hear the culture of the messenger. Missionaries, guys, we all know made a lot of mistakes in the past, and since the West sent out the most missionaries in the last 150 years, it's only natural to conclude and, 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 and to know that most mistakes were made by Western missionaries. It's simple math. Most um, the West sent out the most missionaries in the past. Therefore, mo most mistakes were si made by Western missionaries. M workers to Africa, to India, and in different parts of the world sometimes fail to distinguish their ministry from colonial endeavors and blur the line between winning souls for Christ and expanding the empire. Somewhere along the line in history, Christianity became not only associated with its message, but also with the culture, background, and the skin color of the messengers. We should not easily overlook these mistakes. These are serious, serious mistakes that are not to be repeated again. And we have seen efforts in mission history to overcome this misconception, to be sensitive to culture, so that our, to make sure that our gospel message doesn't come with all the cultural baggages. We, you remember the example of Huston Taylor, insisting on wearing the local clothes, getting the, um, getting the local haircut, mastering the language. When I say language, languages. He not only learned Mandarin, but he actually learned to full fluency, a couple more dialects. I'm still meeting Chinese believers today, recalling from their family tree how the gospel brought to them, but they don't speak of Huston Taylor as somebody who's foreign. They speak of him with fondness, with gratitude, of somebody who is within their culture. His example has helped us to correct this misconception. 
Now, why did Hudson Taylor do that? You know, hairstyles of that day wasn't exactly pretty. I mean, uh, um, the, um, you know, I, I can't imagine those clothes were comfortable. Why did he do that? For one reason only, to shed this idea, this image, this misconception that the message he was bringing to the Chinese people was somehow Western. Nothing scares a missionary more nowadays than the accusation that your message is a, is a Western message. Our family had the privilege of working with two other families in the South Pacific, and I had the privilege of working on a multi cultural, very diverse team. My family's from Taiwan. We work with another family from San Diego, another coworker, another family was from Germany. And thinking back to our time working with this unreached language group, and one of the most common refrain before the gospel presentation, after the gospel presentation, and even the process of planting the church was this message to the unreached language group. We were telling them again and again and again, guys, the message that we brought to you isn't a message from America. It's not a message from Germany. It's not a message from Taiwan. It's a marriage from the creator of the universe. This is not, look at my skin color. I'm different than my coworkers. This is not, my ancestors did not have any German friends. We came from three different parts three different cultures of the world together to bring you this message. We wanted to make sure that the people knew that this is not a Western, uh, Western message. Missionaries today still need to be careful and mindful of this misconception that the gospel is Western. And the first reason is simply from association from the history in the past. But the second reason why this misconception exists that the gospel is Western is due to careless gospel proclamation by missionaries. Careless gospel proclamation by missionaries. Going back to Keller's definition on contextualization to resonate and to defy. When the message or the messenger does not resonate, the message stays foreign. And again, because historically the West has sent out most missionaries when the message stays foreign, it stays Western. It stays Western. Years ago when I was working, our team was working in the unreached people group after we presented the gospel. So there's a small group of believers. One Sunday um, in the church meeting, one of the believers, tribal believers, showed up in the church wearing a black and white oversized suit with long pants and jacket. Guys, like our location was on the equator. It was 100 degrees all the time, 100 degree uh, humi humidity, but this brother showed up wearing long pants and full suit, black and white, in a jacket. And uh, please know that uh, our location was pretty national geographic -y. Uh, Most people, like most kids don't wear clothes until the age of five. There are only several you know, generations after grass skirts. So, like, when this brother showed up wearing this full suit, um, he looked ridiculous. <laughs> now, why did he do that? Why did he do that? Because at that time, when he accepted the gospel, either through errors from the team or we didn't spend enough time with him, he thought somehow, he thought somehow he needed to change not only where he placed his trust, he also needed to change the way he dressed. A little more in his perception, um, what the culture of the messengers usually um, wear. Fortunately, on that day, all the other tribal believers ridiculed him mercilessly that he never, <laughs> I think he probably threw that um, suit into the ocean. I mean, uh, I've never seen that suit again. <laughs> but guys, the region that I served in the South Pacific, in Papua New Guinea and other countries over there, um, it has a very long mission history. Early missionaries, most of them Roman Catholics, brought their message to that region. But unfortunately, a lot of those early missionaries, they never bothered learning the language. In the village, in our village, um, they built a little church complete with steeple and bell. They gave sacraments. This is years ago, before our time. 
They gave sacraments to the people. They baptized everybody. And they gave a Christian English name to every single tribal believer. When our team moved in with uh, this people group, they had not a single verse of Bible translation. They had no clear um, understanding of the gospel. Yet, every villager on the island claimed that they were Christian. We had, mo I mean, to my surprise, we had, we had all the names. We had a James, we had a John, Xavier, Augustine, Abraham, Constantine, Const Benedict. We had a few Moses. I, I, mean, I mean, this is, I thought, man, I, I left everything to serve an unreached people group. And, and, and you could imagine my surprise. I mean, all these very Catholic names were getting introduced to me. Some people believe that as long as you have white teeth, that you will go to heaven. Because having white teeth means that you don't smoke or you don't chew betel nut. Now, where did this language group, without Bible translation, get all these ideas? Through careless gospel proclamation in the past. Sometimes by Catholic, Roman Catholic missionaries. Other times by Protestant missionaries. And because of careless gospel proclamation, the message stays Western that somehow requires Western lifestyle and clothing. Guys, the easiest job on the mission field is to get people to raise their hands. The easiest job on the mission field is to get people to stop doing something, to start doing something, to not drink this and not chew that. But it's much more difficult to explain the gospel in a way that one day they will place their exclu exclusive faith and trust on the cross. Guys, mistakes like these are still happening on the mission field today. Instead of the message of reconciliation, missionaries, through careless gospel proclamation, we are still bringing our cultural baggages to the mission field and thus prolonging this misconception that the gospel is Western. So guys, I gave you two reasons why um, this misconception exists. Number one, simple association in history. Number two, careless gospel proclamation. But what often, the danger is this, though. This misconception has resulted in a paralyzing effect on the mission field and the message that we bring to the missions today. Because what often results from the misconception that the gospel is Western is a desire to de-Westernize the gospel. Guys, I appreciate and I applaud our Western brothers and sisters and the desire to innovate, to correct. But sometimes the fear of past mistakes and colonialism paralyze us to the point where we erroneously put the focus on de-Westernizing the gospel instead of what we should really be doing, reclaiming clarity on the historical gospel. We're putting way too much effort on de-westernizing the gospel and not enough effort on what we really should be doing, reclaiming clarity on the historical gospel. Guys, the misconception is true. This misconception is true that the, it's real. That a lot of people feel like the message that missionaries bring is a Western message. But the only remedy to overcome this is to preach the complete gospel. And that's what this conference is about. Uh, I'm not going to spend my entire session on this, but I'm looking forward to many, many sessions later today and tomorrow um, to paint the complete picture. But guys, uh, let's focus, uh, put the focus back on reclaiming clarity on the historical gospel. Now, I want to say something. I want to say a few words about culture. Is culture good? Is it bad? What does the Bible say about culture? How do we, as we talk about finishing the Great Commission, becoming cross-cultural workers, what exactly are we crossing? What's the nature of culture? In Genesis 1, the first four words of God's revelation to us, in the beginning, God. That's the first four words of God's message to us. And why do we, we all, we, we've all heard this, like why do we say that the gospel transcends culture. Why do we say that? Because 
God and God's story to us begins in the culture vacuum. God says, in the beginning, God. Yes, those words were written in Hebrew, given to the Jews. So we're not denying that there was a cultural context in which the story of God was given. It was given in that, in that ling- language and culture context. But what the inspired word of God is describing when he says, in the beginning, God is a God before time, above time, before the world, above culture, who is not encapsulated by any cultural lenses. So no, the gospel isn't Western because God is not Western. When God says simply, I am who I am, this label rises so far above any culture labels. God simply is. God in the gospel transcends culture. Yet, while God presents himself in the culture vacuum, that's not where we are. God is above culture. God transcends culture. But where we are sitting here today, none of us live in a culture vacuum. You and I, all, we're all within a culture with all of its unique values, metaphors, that shape our understanding of reality. None of us in this room exist in a culture vacuum. And we use the the term cross-cultural workers quite a bit. In order to complete the Great Commission, you and I need to cross-culture, understand it, live in culture. But guys, this is important. We need to recognize as we attempt to bring the gospel cross-culturally to another another people, we need to know this. Culture is not neutral. Culture is not neutral. All cultures in the world are are tainted by sin. My culture is tainted by sin. Every language, unreached language group in their culture, tainted by sin. Western culture, your culture, is tainted by sin. The Bible teaches that sin enters into the world through the disobedience of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and since then, sin has affected every aspect of human existence, including culture. Cultures are comprised of individuals who are inherently sinful, influenced by our own desires, the moral corruption. Our sin often manifests itself in various ways within a culture. When we talk about greed, injustice, violence, oppression, dishonesty, immorality, idolatry, these are all signs of sins coming up, bubbling up, in our culture, we're not just talking about a personal sin. We're talking about collectively, collectively, cultures are not neutral. They are sinful. Paul says in Ephesians 2, verse 1 to 3, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom... We all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. The passage that I just read put the emphasis on all individuals, apart from God's grace, we are enslaved to sin. So what happens when you put a group of people or a single person who is enslaved by sin and you put this person together with another person and and another person. This is why we have to recognize that when we talk about cultures, we're not talking about something that's neutral. A lot of time we talk about personal, the fallenness of sin on a personal level, but that's not forget because you and I were enslaved to sin. Our culture is not cultures are not neutral in Galatians 5 19 Paul talks about the works of the flesh are evident sexual immorality impurity sensuality idolatry sorcery enmity strife jealousy fits of anger rivalries dissensions divisions envy drunkenness orgies and things like these and I warn you as I warned you before those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God we'll A lot of times we apply lists of sins like that to self. But I want you guys to think about 
these sinful behaviors, not only on the individual level, but within the culture. These, all these behaviors infiltrate a culture, and when the culture embraces any one of those sins that Paul mentioned in Galatians 5, it normalizes it. We become accustomed to it. We think that it's natural to, it, it, it no longer bother us as the fall has resulted in the fallen humanity, this fallen humanity manifests itself in culture. It's not a neutral thing. Cultures are stained by sin. But at the same time, it's also important to know that we can still find beauty and goodness in cultures because of God's common grace. Some cultures are more compassionate than others. Some cultures are more forgiving than others. They are distortions and lies in every culture, but there's still goodness and beauty in cultures. But as we cross cultures for the sake of taking the gospel to the nations, let's make no mistake about it. Cultures are not neutral. We're all affected by sin, by the fall of Adam and Eve. Cultures are all different, yet all guilty in Adam. Now, why do we say, though, that the nature of the gospel is unchanging in all cultures. We would agree, we all agree that God's word transcends culture, the gospel transcends culture. But we also recognize that the gospel still needs to be communicated in culture, meaning if I were to present the gospel to another people group with a different language, different culture lands, I have to present the gospel in a foreign language and in their context. And because of these contexts are different, our communications will, all, uh, will also be different. We talked about it already. We need to contextualize our message. But then we must ask, as we take the gospel to different language groups, is there a Chinese gospel? And if there is, then how is that different from the American gospel or the Pakistan? a Pakistani gospel or the Kenyan gospel. When Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations, he gave us a message. And as we take this message to the nations, it needs to be contextualized. So we all recognize that something changes. But the question is this, how much does it change? What part of it changes? Now, going back to the title of this session, the unchanging nature of the gospel over all cultures. The title is not the unchanging presentation of the gospel over all cultures or the unchanging entry point of the gospel in all cultures. No. These things, presentations, entry points, expressions, metaphors may change, oftentimes need to change when we present the gospel in another culture. But when we say the unchanging nature of the gospel, what are we saying? Why is the nature of the gospel unchanging? Why is it unchanging when cultures are so different? The gospel, guys, is ultimately God's solution to a universal human problem. The good news offers hope to bad news. So then we must ask, what is the fundamental problem that the gospel is trying to solve? And does this problem change from culture to culture? Is the Chinese, do they have a different bad news than the Brazilians? Our message to this is, our answer to this is important. Does the problem of humanity change from culture to culture? Because depending on our answer to this question, we might have to change we might have to change the title of this message, the ever-changing nature of the gospel across all cultures. Guys, if we change the problem, what we're doing is we're also changing the solution. If we're changing the fundamental issue that the gospel is trying to solve, then we're also changing the gospel. Guys, we need to guard the gospel. It isn't changing because I want to argue that the ultimate problem every culture faces is also unchanging. Take Mr. Yamato, the Japanese hot spring owner, for example. Guys, honor matters so much in his culture 
that he did what was unthinkable in many other cultures. He could have paid a fine and sailed into a nice retirement, but the concept of shame was so weighty that he took his own life to restore it. In cultures like this one, what is perceived as the ultimate problem, and you might say, Possessing honor or the fear of being dishonored or the fear of bearing shame is the biggest problem. And in a way, you're right. Honor is highly esteemed in this particular culture. Honor is perceived within this culture as something of utmost importance, something that they're willing to die for. If being dishonored is the biggest problem, then Mr. Yamato actually took it further to regain it than most other people would. But did he get it back? Did he get his honor back? No. He can't do it despite paying the ultimate price by taking his own life. You can't try harder than that, yet he still failed. His honor was not restored. His best effort was not enough. So while the people within this culture may think that being dishonored is the biggest problem, that's their perceived notion of the problem but their real problem is not the lack of honor their ultimate problem is that of sin through the disobedience of adam all human existence are now corrupted different cultures may have different set of perceived problems may be fear of unseen spirits or or securing honor but the real problem goes deeper more fundamental our bad news ultimately is a sin problem. We need to guard the bad news as much, as much as we guard the good news. We need to guard the bad news as much as we guard the good news. As our team spent close to four years trying to learn the language, those are the dog days of my missionary career, just very, very much like what Brooks was um, sharing, learning the language, uh, being made fun of, feeling like, man, I, wh- why don't I just stay in the house and read my Bible and be close to God? Like, why, you know, like, like nobody at home would know any differently, but, but, but the courage, I, I mean, I mean to, to step out of the house and put in eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours in the village, being in a constant discomfort socially, relationally, uh, that was the dog days of learning languages. So that, though, it's, it was for the purpose of giving them the gospel. I still remember vividly, after finally learning their language, after four years, we presented um, the gospel to this unreached people group, and it took us almost four, uh, two months teaching daily from Genesis to the cross. I remember vividly, early on, as we taught on the fall of Satan, We taught how an angel became prideful, and because of that, he was driven out from the presence of a holy God. And the next morning, as I was walking in the village, a um, tribal friend came up to me, and he said, Wayne, I listened to your message yesterday, and I was so scared last night that I could not sleep. And he said, I heard about this, this angel. He committed, he broke God's law one time, one time, and then he was driven out from God's presence. One time. Do you know how much time I screwed up? <laughs> Do you know how many times I've done bad things? If the angel was held responsible for that one time that he got prideful, then I am completely hopeless. Our team continues spend, continue to spend the next weeks teaching through Genesis 1 to 3, taking our time and as well as the major themes in the Old Testament. The first three chapters in Genesis took almost two weeks going, establishing the characters of God. We slowly move toward the fall of Adam and Eve and, and, and how God's original plan for them was to provide for them, was for them to trust Him exclusively. But as Adam and Eve made the choice to take a bite of that fruit. That was not, we taught, explaining that the fall was not merely a moral mistake, but
but a rejection of God's plan for their lives. When Adam and Eve um, ate the fruit, it was their decoration to God. God, we are rejecting your authority. You don't get to decide what's good for me. We are deciding for ourselves. This rejection is called sin, and now we're all under sin's cause. We cannot save ourselves, we tell the people. Sin is the reason for all the fear of the evil spirits on the island. Sin is the reason for all the sickness, all the death on the island. Conflict, fear, and shame, and murder, and sin, and, and, and all the junk that was happening on the island, it's because of the fall of Adam and Eve. And then we slowly took the people through the Old Testament, one by one, one by one. Whenever a new theme in the Old Testament came up, the people's eyes lit up. Is this the way, is this the answer to take away the sin problem? Is it animal sacrifice? No, it's not. Not these animals. Is it through rituals and special worships? No, they don't help either. Is it through high priest? No, they're also under the curse of sin. When we got to uh, teaching them about the laws and taught that the purpose of the law was not to take away sins, but is to show us that we are indeed sinful. But the law itself does not take away our sins. When we taught that, about one-third of the people, they got so angry at, uh, at us, they stood up and they left, never came back again. Why? Why did they do that? Because we were hitting a worldview. We were, we were not just resonating with them. We were speaking at a level where nobody from the outside ever spoke language like that. We were resonating with them, but yet we were taking the biblical truth and we were defying their understanding of how to save themselves. Why did they get so angry at the teaching that the law's purpose was uh, to expose our sinful nature. Now, you, when, you take, when you take away animals, rituals, human mediators away, what hope is left for a tribal animist? The only hope that was left for them was, there's got to be something within myself. I, there's got to be a way for me to earn this reconciliation with God through good works. So when we took that away, a lot of people got angry at us. But it wasn't because they weren't clear on what we're saying. They were exact, they were sure. They got crystal clarity on what we're saying and they decided to leave. By the time we got to the New Testament, some people started to come to us and said, Wayne, we got it. You don't have to teach on this anymore. We can't save ourselves. It's okay. Like, give us the answer. Because we were still taking him through the Pharisees and all the different ways. It's like, man, it's a different story, but like, we get it. We can't save ourselves until one day one um, tribal person, I, he's a believer now, he came up to me almost in anger, almost in anger, and, and, and said, enough. I know I can't save myself. You need to tell us the answer today. So, guys, so when we got to the cross, Everybody knew not only that a person died and is ready to bless them. No, they knew exactly who Jesus was. They knew exactly what he died for. They knew exactly whose place Jesus took on the cross. We spent months talking about the bad news. We wanted the gospel to properly point out the fundamental problem of our people. It was more than just their inability to control the spirit or lack of modernity or, or avoiding shame in their culture. It was sin. When the gospel pointed out that their fundamental problem was sin and when God opened their eyes, you had this people group for the first time understanding their primary issue in their life and then embracing the solution that God gave. Furthermore, they were able to throw off their culture's perceived reasons why everything went wrong. It was not because of the ancestral spirits. It was not because the people uh, uh, just, they could not get along. It was, they, once they understood the gospel, they were able to accurately 
correct their culture to come in line with the unchanging nature of the gospel. Guys, cultures are different. And within every culture, there's a set of perceived problems and answers. The problems are real. Honor really matters in some cultures. And many people woke up today thinking that how do I manipulate the spirits around me so that my, so that my, wives could be, uh, my lives could be better. The problems are real. But guys, God views, God views what all cultures need just the same. As different as the perceived problems are, God's view of all cultures and all of our need just the same. Every culture is corrupted by sin. We are all guilty in Adam. And because of that, whatever our sin-infested culture says our biggest problem is, may it be losing honor, bondage to fear, the culturally perceived problem is not our fundamental problem. Our fundamental problem is sin. From that stems different secondary issues, but when a culture mistakes a tertiary or secondary issue as the primary issue, then this mistake somehow masks, masks and hides the primary issue, the real issue, that is sin. And we see the gospel, the scriptures again and again shines a spotlight on the primary problem that the cross is trying to solve or solve, and that is sin. The gospel also speaks to shame and fear as well, but not in a way that takes the spotlight off the fundamental problem of sin. The gospel will resonate and it will defy. It must resonate and defy. As we take the gospel across cultures, we will need to build necessary bridges explaining to the people what the gospel is using cultural metaphors. But at the same time, we need to build necessary walls explaining what the gospel is not using relevant cultural metaphors. And the nature of the gospel is unchanging. Why? Because the fundamental problem has never changed. It is a problem of sin. We need to guard the bad news as much as we guard the good news in order to preserve the unchanging nature of the gospel. Guys, there is always going to be tension between culture and the gospel. And sometimes we want to resonate. We also know that we need to defy. We want the people to accept the gospel. At the same time, we know that the gospel will offend. And this tension sometimes in, in itself is good and healthy. It slows us down to listen, to observe, and to learn before we speak. But in moments, in these moments of tension, we need to be careful in guarding the unchanging nature of the gospel. Let me say this again. Just because a, a culture has a hard time understanding the gospel, it does not automatically mean that the, the presentation wasn't culturally relevant. In the same vein, just because a culture embraces a particular presentation of the gospel, it doesn't automatically mean that the gospel presentation is biblically sound. Several years ago in Taiwan, a local church came to me with some issues of their church plan in Southeast Asia. This church sent out a missionary team to do a church plan in Southeast Asia. They presented the gospel, they planted a church, baptized believers, appointed leaders. Everything seemed to be going well until one day the missionaries found out that most ladies still went to witch doctors whenever their kids got sick. One of the key leaders in the church they found out still had local uh, statues, idols in their house, and he never stopped worshiping them. So the sending church and the team, they were perplexed. They had the numbers, they had the gathering, they had a church, they had programs. But they were not sure about what went wrong. Um, so after talking to them, well, for one, um, they never, the team never bothered to learn the local language. They used translators instead. Um, most of the translators have been unbelievers. And uh, later I asked them about, well, what exactly did you tell them? 
Uh, what exactly, uh, what was your gospel message? What did you ask them to believe? And the missionaries told me that, well, they observed that the people lived in fear of sickness um, and witchcraft. So because of that, they taught the people that you need to believe in Jesus because he has the power to drive away these evil spirits. And he's, uh, if you believe in Jesus, he is there to bless you. So the locals readily embrace this version of the gospel presentation. But in this version of the gospel presentation, though Jesus was to their eyes culturally relevant, he is but a distorted shadow of the biblical Jesus. This version of Jesus satisfied the appetite of the culture, but redeemed nothing. The missionaries dealt with the results of sin, witchcraft, sickness, death. The missionary dealt with the secondary issues that stemmed from sin, fear, sickness, but they did not deal with, they did not answer the fundamental issue of sin itself. Despite the missionary's best efforts, the gospel they presented was incomplete and false. We would do well, guys, to remember the example of the Apostle Paul. See, for Paul, knowing what people want does not translate into giving the people what they want. In the passage that's been cited uh, you know, several times by, by all the speakers in 1 Corinthians 1, 22, Jews demanded signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. Guys, Greeks wanted wisdom, eloquence. Give me logic. Give me beautiful discourse. The Jews wanted power encounters. They want miracles. But Paul did not give them what they wanted. The message was clear. Christ in him crucified. In 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4, Paul says this, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your disobedience is complete. Paul talks about in this passage taking down strongholds, arguments, and lofty opinions. And a lot of times we apply this passage to spiritual warfare. And rightfully so, Paul is talking about a war that is not, wa that is not waged according to the flesh. But let's not forget, where do these strongholds and arguments and lofty opinions manifest themselves? They show up in cultures. The tyranny of being culturally relevant sometimes, you know, put us, holds us hostage. In, you know, sometimes um, we, we place culture in such, in such a high regard that it becomes something that is untouchable and not to be offended at all costs. The tyranny of being culturally relevant takes us hostage sometimes here in our culture and many, many times overseas on the mission field. But Paul says here, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. Cultures are stained by sins, yes, but missionaries must embrace the study of culture because the study of culture, gaining insight into local culture, reveals the true idols of the people, all its hidden desires and misunderstandings and distortions of the ultimate problem. We don't let culture drive us, but we hold culture with the utmost respect and importance because it gives us an insight on how Satan lied to the people so that indeed we can destroy every argument and every, every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. The missionary task is to understand different cultures' own set of their answers of the human problem. Answers from a sin-distorted culture. And first, have empathy. Have empathy. Let's cry with the Japanese gentleman who took his own life. 
Let's tell him that we understand the terrible feeling of shame that he endured. But let's also tell him that taking his own life did not restore the shame, that, that the honor he was seeking. He is incapable of helping himself. The truth is that this feeling of shame comes from all human beings breaking God's law, God's standard for life. The shame that he feels stems from his sin problem. Let's bring him back to the cross and the empty tomb and tell him that he didn't have to take his own life because somebody else did. Jesus took his place of punishment and opened up a road to be reconciled to him. And it is out of that new relationship that all blessings, including the removal of shame, the restoration of honor, will be found. The ultimate problem of sin must be dealt with. We all know in the passage in Revelation 7, we have a great multitude that no one can count from every nation, all tribes, peoples, and languages coming back before, get, gathered before the lamb that was slain. What we're seeing is the redemptions of all peoples from different culture, people from every nation, tribe, and language. There was the scattering of people in Babel. Now is, there's a regathering of all peoples to the lamb that was slain. Now when the nations sing, salvation belongs to our God. They will not be singing because one group got innocence out of the gospel, another group got honor out of the gospel, another group got freedom out of the gospel. We will all be singing in unison because of the recognition that our sin problem was taken care of on the cross and in the empty tomb. We will all sing because of the one gospel where Christ redeemed us with the bloody cross in the empty tomb. The lamb that was slain redeemed us from our sin and dishonor and shame and fear and bondage to the powers of this, this world. The complete gospel satisfies all of our deepest longings. The complete gospel satisfies all of our deepest longings. Let me close with Paul's prayer in Ephesians 3. Paul prays this. We're familiar with Paul's prayer here. He says, he prays, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may drill in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Verse 20, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work with us, to him be the glory in the church, and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Paul made it clear in the beginning of his prayer that he was praying for all cultures. He bows his knee before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. Every family. My family in Taiwan. Brooks's family in San Diego. Ian's family from Scotland, every single ethnicity, every single family tree in this room, Paul's prayer was for you. And Paul prayed, he included everybody in this prayer. And then he turns to the riches of God's glory and the love of God, love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. I still don't know why Christ would take my place on the cross. I can't think of one thing one right thing that I did in my life that was worthy to earn God's grace in my life. The love of Christ surpasses knowledge. And at this point, Paul closes with the doxology. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we could think or ask, immeasurably more than any culture could imagine. Let me say this again. The complete gospel satisfies all of our deepest longings and more. This is the gospel that the unreached nations need to hear.
To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen.